Hi everyone, welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Clark Wolf, and this is our daily show bringing you the latest in movie news with insight into what it all means. Joining me as always is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief John Campia. John, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Greetings and salutations. Good morning, Clark. Good morning, John. And also joining us this morning is AMC Production Manager Dennis Sen. Dennis, good morning. Good morning to you guys as well. Well, hey guys, listen, well, we got to, I, I said on yesterday's show that I had a couple of announcements to make today regarding uh, Comic-Con. One, one is a new announcement, one is one that we're just kind of rehashing. The one that uh, is brand new, as some of you may know, every year at Comic-Con, I, I uh, run this little panel called the Masters of the Web, where we get together some of the biggest and best pundits, movie pundits online, together in one room, and we usually have like some movie star or director there to help us moderate, and it's always a lot of fun. Um, and this year is going to be no exception. This year, for the Com Masters of the Web, Web Comic-Con panel that I'm running, uh, I'm really excited. We are going to make it a horror theme. So there is a horror theme this year, um, and part of the reason we're doing horror is because I wanted to do a genre-specific theme for quite a while, and we've got some great people on the panel, including you know Ryan Turek, Ryan Rotten from Shock to You Drop, uh, and you know what? I'm going to keep the rest of it a bit of a secret for now, but <clears throat> it's going to be awesome, and we're partnering up with the new Lionsgate horror film, You're Next. Now, if you follow horror at all, you know the reviews for this horror film are going through there's a lot of people calling it one of the best horror films in years it's uh, really really good and we're going to be partnering with them for the panel as well we're going to be doing a special screening of your next at uh, comic-con this year which we're really stoked about but anyway you can look in the description of this video and we've got a link we just started a facebook event page for the masters of the web if you look in the description of the video you'll see a link to it and you can go there you'll see who's on the panel uh it's going to be the thursday of comic-con in room 24 abc <laughs> from 11 30 to 12 30 in the morning we're really excited about it so we'll keep announcing it during the week but just like once again look in the description you'll see a link to the event page for the masters of the web horror theme at the comic-con this year the other thing we're going to do at comic-con I, I mentioned this before Reaffirming it now, we are going to have an AMC Movie Talk meet and greet, Woo! which is going to be great. It's going to be the Thursday night, probably at 7 p.m. We'll shore up the exact times later. But basically, it's just casual. We're going to be at the bar hanging out. You just come on in and say hi. And we're just, we'll just all hang out together for, for a couple hours. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be there. Dennis Zen's going to be there. Whoop, whoop. Clark Wolf will be there. Whoop, whoop. Chris Lee Kennedy's going to be there. Um, Brooke Chavez is going to be there. John Schnepp is going to be there. Gray Drake is going to be there. The whole, basically, AMC Movie Talk crew, we're all going to be there hanging out. So if you're going to be at Comic-Con this year, make sure you come by. I'm going to be launching the event page for the AMC Movie Talk meet and greet later today or tomorrow. We'll put the link in once it's ready. But make plans of being at the San Diego Comic-Con. Come to the Masters of the Web panel, where that I'll be running, of course, and make sure you come to our AMC Movie Talk meet and greet. So that's all the announcements for today. Back yeah. to class. Those are all excellent, excellent <laughs> announcements. Very excited. And now we're going to start with a not-so-excellent announcement. Mm. Uh, we're going to start today with some incredibly bad news. Yesterday, actor James Gandolfini passed away from a heart attack at the age of 51. Gandolfini was obviously best known for his work as Tony Soprano on the HBO hit show The Sopranos between 1999 and 2007. Gandolfini received three primetime Emmys as well as a Golden Globe for his portrayal as the popular New Jersey gangster. Gandolfini also put together an impressive and prolific film career which just recently included films like Zero Dark Thirty, the Incredible Burt Wonderstone, Not Fade Away, and Killing Them Softly, just to name a few. John, your thoughts on the passing of James Gandolfini? Shocked. Yeah. Shocked. Um, it, it, was, it was so sudden and so very tragic. You know, it's funny. I was, The Incredible Burt Wonderstone was just out. <clears throat> and I remember I was talking to, uh, I was at the junket in Las Vegas for it, and I was talking to a couple of my, uh, uh, my cohorts down there, who uh, are movie journalists for other sites. And we were hanging out and just talking. I said, you know, the parts, some of the parts that killed me were Gandolfini. Gandolfini, there's two things that always stood out to me about Gandolfini. Number one, strength. Whenever he came on screen, you knew this was a character of power. That he, he unlike, and he wasn't a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. he, there was just something, and it's not even because we knew him as Soprano. There's something about him that when he came on screen, it was power. 
And and that's very rare to have that you can exude any one really characteristic like that. And he was able to nail that strength and power. It was incredible. And watching Burt Wonderstone, and I know it's weird out of all the stuff that he's done, I'm, I'm focusing on Burt Wonderstone. But he played dry so well, too. And playing the, the, the head of the hotel chain, the head of Bally's and all this kind of stuff, playing a guy who's really not even all that enthusiastic, but pretending to be enthusiastic. Like, there's so many layers, like, uh, welcome to Bally's. We're so happy you've chosen to be with us for your Las Vegas stay. There's something just so, whenever he would talk in that movie, I wanted to crack up, you know? And he had, and I think part of that is because you see him as so strong, but you could tell he's kind of bored and trying to be enthusiastic, pushing this. So many different layers, um, you know, and it was always fun to see him pop up in things. Like when he popped up in Zero Dark Thirty, it's like cool. I mean, you see him pop up in a lot of different things. It's it's really sad and unfortunate. And, you know, even just in the last six months, there was renewed talk about, hey, maybe we should look at possibly developing a Sopranos movie. There was some renewed interest in that. And just, just a tragedy. The dude's so young, 51 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, he still had such a huge career, just really, th- this part of his career really just really gaining momentum now. And just a, just a sad, sad day. I'll miss him a lot. Dennis, when you think of uh, James Gandolfini, what do you think of? Yeah, I was really surprised. Um, he, he, he's a phenomenal actor, and I kind of was hoping it was one of those internet hoax things. You That's know, the that first thing I thought, I actually. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, hope, <laughs> hope, hope this, this actually isn't true, but... Yeah, the first thing I remember ever seeing him in was uh, True Romance. Yep. Uh, yep. He had that, that crazy scene with uh, Patricia Arquette. That's the a scene a lot room. of people talk about when they talk about the movie at all, is, is that scene, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, he, he's a great actor. I watched him all in The Sopranos, and, and, and he, he's been in a lot of good stuff lately. And I, I feel like he, he was going to start being in more and more films. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just sad that uh, he had to pass away pretty early. I mean, 51 it's not not that old. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know the odd thing was there was uh, a celebrity hoax. Remember, it was yeah. just, just about a year ago that oh, actor James Gandolfini dies. There was mm. just just that last year, uh, and I hate those things. Those yeah. things bug me so much because you're devastating some people who maybe know him. Yeah. But that aside, yeah, a, a great career, uh, a great actor, a great talent, and uh, he will be missed. Absolutely. As many of you know, actress Shailene Woodley has been cast to play the iconic Peter Parker love interest Mary Jane Watson in the upcoming Amazing Spider-Man 2. We've already seen several set images of her shooting scenes for the film, except it appears that we won't be seeing those scenes or any other with Woodley in the movie. According to a recent interview, director Mark Webb has decided to pull the character Mary Jane out of the movie altogether. Webb is quoted as saying the following, I made a creative decision to streamline the story and focus on Peter and Gwen and their relationship, said director Mark Webb in a statement. Shailene is an incredibly talented actress, and while we only shot a few scenes with Mary Jane, we all loved working with her. When asked about having her character taken out of the film, Woodley said the following, of course I'm bummed, said the actress, but I'm a firm believer in everything happening for a specific reason. Based on the proposed plot, I completely understand holding off on introducing Mary Jane until the next film. John, are you surprised Mark Webb has opted to take Mary Jane out of the film. Surprised, yes, Mm -hmm. but also thrilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not because I had a problem with Mary Jane being in there, but I'm thrilled that Mark Webb is kind of director that goes, he sits back and goes, you know what? I feel like there's too much going on. And just because we've already shot the scenes and just because it's already been marketed, I feel like there's too much going on. I feel we, if we made this move, it would make a better film that he had then the guts to make that move. And, and bra- bravo to Sony for allowing him to make that move. Um, this is great because look, in any superhero movie, we all hate the love stories. They are the most useless part of superhero movies. Now, I understand many times they serve a function, but I wish they would keep the function very small and keep it confined to that function and not waste valuable screen time. Like, I love Thor. Love it. But that scene on the rooftop of him and Natalie Portman looking at the stars, it's like, please, move on. You know, get to some other story elements. Get back to Loki. Get back to go, go, get back to wherever, anywhere else than right here. Um, and Iron Man and, and uh, Pepper Potts might be a little bit of a different story. That's the one I can put up with most because that's the, a really cool relationship. But look, you've already got him with Emma Watson. 
Uh, not Emma, <laughs> I'm mixing names. Up. <laughs> that would be you've interesting. Already, you've already got you know him uh, with Emma Stone, and you, now you're introducing another you know is the ultimate love interest for Peter Parker in there. On top of all the other story elements going on, nah, I love the decision Mark Webb has said by saying, you know what, let's just pull this element out. Let's just focus on him and Emma and what the rest of the movie is really about. Love the decision. Very happy. And we'll, we'll get to see Shailene Woodley as Mary Jane in, in Spider-Man 3. Um, and, uh, and no harm done. So maybe they'll even use the scenes they've already shot. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But Dennis, you saw the news. What did you think about this? Um, I, I, two words come to mind. Uh, respect and trust. Respect mm. that Mark Webb actually is doing something that's not easy to do. And, yeah. And kind of a gamble in, in serving the story. So I respect Mark Webb for that. And then trust, Sony must trust Mark Webb a lot yeah. in order to let him do it. Because yeah, I'm sure it's not something easy for them to do. But I think they trust him enough because of the job he did with the first one. So I think ultimately it probably will serve the movie better. And like like you said, we're going to see her in the third one anyway, so it's not that big a deal. Yeah, and one of the other things, too, like somebody brought up to me and made a valid point. It's like, well, why didn't... They know that it was too complicated. It was complicating the story too much when they looked at the script. Well, dude, you got to understand, the script is one thing. It's another thing when you actually start sitting back in the trailer and looking at the dailies and you're looking at the footage and you're starting to piece together the movie. That It starts to feel like a very different thing. Because remember, every movie that goes in production, people think they have a great script. Right. I mean, I, I said this on the show the other day. I read the script to Wrath of the Titans like, five months before it came out. Mm -hmm. And I thought the script was awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm like, holy crap, they fixed the Clash of the Titans. This is gonna be really good. And the movie sucked. Mm -hmm. So the script is one thing, the reality is another. And I respect that Webb sat back, like Dennis was saying, looked at the, looked at the footage, saw how the movie was coming together and said, nope, we gotta pull this. And they did, and, and big respect, mad respect. All right, folks, listen, we've reached that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Clark has got a few other items from the world of movie news. She's going to go through them, and Dennis and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Clark, what do we got? Stop the presses! Fifty Shades of Grey has officially landed its director. Woo! I know everybody's so excited. Universal Pictures and Focus Features today announced that Sam Taylor Johnson will direct the film adaptation. Taylor Johnson most recently directed 2009's Nowhere Boy, the story of John Lennon's childhood in Liverpool, where his genius found a kindred spirit in teenage Paul McCartney. The film earned two BAFTA nominations, including Outstanding British Film. John, buy or sell Sam Taylor Johnson directing Fifty shades of gray sell uh, and i sell this hard and look all due respect uh to sam taylor johnson uh nowhere boy i saw it i, I didn't love it but it's a nice little film um I, I, and she's also really well known for this little sh a short film that she did that got some play at Cannes, and, and i never saw that one so full disclosure i didn't see the short film she did but nowhere boy's a nice little film and full marks to to sam for being married to kick asses aaron taylor johnson a dude 20 years younger than her so, hats off. Uh, well done. But I'm sorry. Um, when you have guys like Joe Wright and Gus Van Sant, proven, academy-level, uh, directing talent, who apparently were interested in, in doing this film, and you go with somebody like Sam, I lost all respect. Because um, I was saying when Joe Wright was lining up for this and when Gus Van Sant were lining up, I remember I was saying on the show, holy crap, suddenly Fifty Shades of Grey has gone from this kind of laughable little throwaway movie to this is a serious force to be reckoned with now. If we got directing talent like this lining up, who knows who's going to want to, what kind of A-list actors are going to want to line up to work with the directors in this kind of film. This is now a serious film. Well, guess what? Like that, it's become a throwaway joke to me again. Hmm. Um, when you, if you're, look, and once again, I don't know all the inside scoop. Maybe Gus Van Sant changed his mind. Maybe Joe Wright decided he didn't want to do it. Maybe all these other guys have decided that, no, this is not the type of film that we really want to work on and we're not going to do, and just walked away from it. And in that case, maybe they were left with, with her. But I'm, I'm sorry, on the surface, if you just chose her over other caliber guys like that, then once again, then, then for me, Fifty Shades of Grey has fallen off my radar. It's once again a laughable throwaway film. I don't care about it. I will obviously give the film a chance when it comes out because sometimes it's those laughable throwaway films that really jump up and surprise you. Maybe Fifty Shades of Grey will do that. I'm just saying right now in advance, to me, it's just fallen off my radar. So a sell. Dennis? Yeah, I'm going to have to sell it for the same reasons. Um, 
you know, if you have a director like Gus Van Sant and Joe Wright willing to do something that most people wouldn't touch, yeah. <laughs> like a 20 foot pole. And, and if they just decided to go with someone else, I, I didn't see nowhere boy. So I can't say like the quality of director that she is. Uh, and I'm not even saying anything bad about her. I'm just saying that if you have these kind of proven, uh, directors already, it, it's probably better to go with them mm. instead. And, and get people to take it more seriously because right now no one no one's really taking it seriously when i heard this story i thought of mary heron directing mm. american psycho yep. and not the maybe the most conventional choice you could have thought of and to be fair american psycho's source material and 50 shades of gray source material <laughs> not the exact things. not the same thing but that's what popped into my head was so we'll we'll see though we'll see I, Fifty Shades of Grey, oh boy, <laughs> okay. They're here. According to reports, MGM and Fox have reached an agreement to co-finance a remake of the 1982 classic horror film Poltergeist. The film is set to start shooting this fall and will be directed by Monster House and City of Ember director Gil Keenan. In a revisionist take on the classic horror film, a family struggling to make ends meet relocates to an outdated suburban home and is confronted by an angry spirit who kidnaps their youngest daughter and challenges them to band together to rescue her from the clutches of evil. Dennis, buy or sell a Poltergeist remake? I have to ignorantly buy this <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not a huge horror fan, so I don't know the genre that well. And Poltergeist, I don't, I'm not even sure if I saw the entire movie, maybe clips here and there oh, when wow. I was younger. So for me, I'll just ignorantly buy it. Uh, I'm going to buy it. Uh, I think this is one of those films that is ripe for a remake. I love the original. It's so classic. It's so influential. But, you know, it's it was decades ago. And it could use a fresh retelling. And, you know, you guys know my position on remakes. If they do the remake and it sucks, who cares? We still got the original. And if they do a remake and it's a really good film, great. It, it might re-increase appreciation for the original even more. So, for that reason and more, I, I like it. Now, Clark, I know you've got some thoughts on, on Poltergeist. What do you think about this? So, I am a big horror junkie, as right. as as you all know, and as some of our movie talkers may know, and so I'm so excited for your Masters in the Web panel this, at Comic-Con, it's gonna be great. For me, I am also, like you, I I'm like re the idea of a remake because hey, if it's good, awesome, you, you upgrade the material. If not, whatever, you still got the original. But for me, I think that this is a sell because we've already gotten a remake of Poltergeist. It was called Insidious. It's the same movie. And I love Insidious, and I'm the biggest fan of James Wan and Lee Winnell that there is. But even Patrick Wilson looked like Craig T. Nelson. <laughs> He's wearing the same costume as Craig T. Nelson. And then, on top of that, we got Dark Skies just recently. And even though that's an alien flick, that crew was 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 outspoken about what an influence Poltergeist was on that film. So for me, I feel like we've already gotten the remake twice. Um, but I I'm under I understand James Marston is attached uh, to yeah. the Poltergeist remake, and I love him, and I want to see him do more of anything. But for me, I'm like, why do we have to call this Poltergeist? Why can't we? Why can't we just? I don't know. Call it something else. Why does it have to be a remake? See, I don't. I don't really have a problem with it because I think there's there's been a lot of haunted house movies. Right. I mean, lots and lots and lots of them, but only one Poltergeist. My one bit of hesitation. I should have mentioned this earlier. My one bit of hesitation on this is Gil Keenan, uh, and I say hesitation, mm. not opposition. But Keenan so far has done kids films. Now, granted, Monster House was a horror themed kids film but it's still an animated kids film uh city of ember is a kids film i, I, th I mean you know, in a way if you, depending on how you view it um so he's the one kind of question mark for me in this but still overall i'm gonna stay with a bye we'll see what happens and Gil Keenan, I just want to throw this out there with Monster House. When I watched Monster House, I was like, wow, this is the Goonies sequel we never got. Like, this is so that Spielberg era kind of movie. So I think that might be actually a cool fit for the Poltergeist remake, but we shall see. Okay, moving on. Iron Man 3 has passed the $400 million box office plateau, racking up $400.3 million after just seven weeks in release. That's insane. Director Shane Black's blockbuster has earned over $1.2 billion worldwide, making it the fifth highest grossing movie of all time behind Avatar with $2.7 billion, Titanic with $2.1 billion, 
billion, Marvel's The Avengers with 1.5 billion, and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, 1.3 billion. It's also scored the second highest opening weekend in history with $174.1 million last month. John, buy or sell the success of Iron Man 3. Well, you gotta buy it. And, and this just goes back to something I say all the time momentum. Iron Man 3 did so great, not because it in and of itself is the is all that great. I really like Iron Man 3, everybody knows that, but it's not one of the all-time great comic book films. But it did so great because it was coming off Avengers 2, or off of Avengers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have literally had the Avengers sitting around a boardroom for two hours talking about what they're going to order for dinner. Falafel. Yeah, falafel <laughs> probably. And it would have scored a $120 million opening weekend. Um, so it's all about momentum. The reason Spider-Man 3, despite the fact that we all acknowledge it's the weakest of the Spider-Man films, the reason it made the most money is because Spider-Man 2 was so awesome. The reason Man of Steel did not make $300 million at the box office opening weekend is because it's coming off of a fairly weekly received Superman film and Superman Returns back in 2006. It's all about momentum when you're talking about these franchise types of films. And, you know, if they did an Iron Man 4 next month if iron man 4 came out next month you would it would still make a lot of money but you would not see the type of mm -hmm. reception because less people are that enthusiastic about iron man 3 so you would see a dip um and it just kind of goes to to really reaffirm that still it's impressive huge 400 million domestically Crazy. extremely rare the i mean studios are dancing when a movie hits 100 million in, <laughs> domestically let alone yeah. 400 so yeah dennis how do you see this um, I, I buy it. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the success of Iron Man 3, but I, I don't quite understand is it's the worst movie ever made, so <laughs> according to some people. Yeah. It, it, Not it, according it, to us. Yeah, no. no. But according to some people, it's the worst movie ever made, and it deserves no success whatsoever. <laughs> and yet everyone went to see it. Yes. Twice, Twice, apparently. Twice, exactly. Yeah. All right, folks, listen, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Here's how this works. Look, if you've got a topic or a question that you would like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, we get to two or three questions every day here on AMC Movie Talk, but we've also started a new show called AMC Mailbag. And that airs on our AMC Movie News YouTube channel every Saturday and Sunday, starting this Saturday. And basically what it is is all we do is talk mailbag questions. All we do is take mailbag questions. It's a bit longer than AMC Movie Talk. It's a lot more casual, and we're just talking movies. So make sure you tune in and check it out on Saturday and Sunday. Send in your question. Maybe it'll be on AMC Movie Talk. Maybe it'll be on AMC Mailbag. You'll have to check it out and see. So right now, Clark's got a couple of messages pulled out of the mailbag. Clark, what do we got? The Seal Toronto writes, Hey guys, love your work. With Transcendence and Interstellar set to be released in 2014, do you think Christopher Nolan uh, Christopher Nolan has his mind set on any other work. Is it possible we may see a sequel to one of his previous films? Um, very good question. Um, does he have his mind set on other things? I'm sure Christopher Nolan yeah. probably has. It, it has any director. Look, I directed one feature film, and I've got like 80 different movies I want to do. I'm sure Christopher Nolan has got like a thousand. Dennis has made a lot of stuff. I'm sure he's got a thousand projects he wants to do. So I'm sure he's got his mind set on stuff. But the question is, does any of the things in his mind include a sequel to any of his previous work? I gotta guess no. Mm -hmm. I don't think he does. It's not because he's against sequels. Well, Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises kind of suggest that he might be okay with sequels. <laughs> but when you look at his individual films, uh, Memento, can't really do a sequel on that. Um, the Prestige, not really anywhere you can nope. go with a sequel with that. Uh, Insomnia, nowhere really to go with that. <laughs> still um, awake. Insomnia yeah. too. Still it's, awake. Still awake. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 the one he just did. Oh, the spinning top. Oh, Inception. Inception. <laughs> that, um, Inception. Uh, we talked about a possible Inception sequel before. Mm -hmm. None of us really see how it, it lose. It's lost its novelty unless you go into Inception two and you go to, oh my god, he's in a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream, and keep going. Nah, there's nowhere to go. So I think for that, I don't think Nolan would be against sequels. I just don't see any of his movies that really lend themselves to sequels, especially now that his Dark Knight uh, store universe is closed and done. I, I just don't see where he could go. So it'll probably be other more original things. Dennis, do you see it differently? No, I don't think he will do any sequels. And I, I don't think he's against them, but I, for his own movies that he creates himself, like The Prestige and Inception and stuff like that, I don't... 
I don't think he sees those as continuations. He he he, he wants like a, a beginning and end to the movie, and that's it. Yeah. I think Dark Knight and Batman is a different story. It's a franchise. He knew going in mm-hmm. that he was going to have to do three movies, and I, unless he he does a movie from the outset and says, "Okay, this is a trilogy, and this is the first part," I don't think right. he's the type of person to go. Well, that was a big success. Let's make another one. It has to fit into the story that he already conceived beforehand. So I, I, I don't I don't see it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. CJ writes, hey, guys, I love your show. My question is based on your opinions of Topher Grace and Spider-Man 3 as Eddie Brock, a.k.a. Venom. Do you think it would be a good idea to bring Venom for the Amazing Spider-Man 3 or 4 or leave Venom out and why? This is going to be a really subjective thing. For me personally, look, I, I didn't... <sighs> I, I've read just like anybody else. I've, I've read a bunch of Spider-Man, but I, but I'm not a. I would not consider myself a Spider-Man, you know, authority by any stretch of the imagination. The people who I do know that would be Spider-Man authorities say, you know, Goblin, Hobgoblin. That that's kind of Spider-Man's guy. Doc Ock maybe, but to me, as a more casual fan of Spider-Man, Venom is it. To me, Venom is the coolest. Vi- uh, villain for Spider-Man. He's just the coolest character. Um, and what's the name of his red offspring again? Um, Carnage. Carnage, mm-hmm. thank you. I was going to say Scarage for some reason. <laughs> Carnage is also like one level f- past Venom. But, but Venom, he, there's just so much that's so cool about that character. I don't know what their plans are. I don't know. It, it, they seem to already have their roadmap yeah. laid out for three and four, and I don't know if Venom is included in that roadmap. I really hope it is. If I was in charge of Sony, I would put him in. I would give the fans the Venom that they've been wanting for a very long time. There's so much beautiful stuff you could do with him visually. Um, he's so dark and badass. He could be a real nice balance to the more lighthearted nature of Spider-Man himself. I would love to see Venom. Whether they have him in the plans, though, I probably doubt they do, but I hope they do. Dennis? Oh, I would love to see Venom. I mean, he's, I mean, the quintessential Spider Man villain is Green Goblin. Yeah. But Venom kind of lately has been like this fan favorite because of, you know, the way he looks and and acts and stuff like that. I I, I thought they did a terrible job in Spider Man 3. Yeah. Like, I was like, that's not Venom. (laughs) Um, so I would like to see it. I remember when James Cameron was rumored to, he, before Sam Raimi did Spider-Man, he was going to do uh, the Spider-Man movie. Yeah. And I was like, man, he would do some crazy good stuff with with Venom and the way he had um, pushed the visual effects envelope with uh, Terminator 2, you mm-hmm. know, with the, the, mm-hmm. the T-1000. And I was like, oh, wow, he could apply that to the Venom suit and oh, yeah. make it really cool. So I would really like to see a Venom and a Venom done right so yeah Howard Millington Lee writes hey guys I'm a fan of the show here is my question do you think in the next Man of Steel movie they will introduce kryptonite as one of Superman's weaknesses because in the movie there was a scene when General Zod was telling Superman how they use the ship to travel to find him and in that scene when the ship uh, teleports you can see pieces of Krypton travels with it turning the rocks green what do you think I didn't see, um, thanks a lot for the question, Howard. I didn't see that myself, and I've seen the movie a couple times. I'll go, but no, that gives me a reason why I need to go back and watch it again. <laughs> Man of Steel, tonight, AMC. All right, so to me, this is a, there is no question, no question. You absolutely must introduce kryptonite or a form of kryptonite into the Man of Steel universe if... WB is intent on expanding the DC universe because Superman is a god. I mean, to to quote Jor-El, he'll be a god to them. He is. He he can see all. He can hear all. He's invulnerable. He's like nobody stronger. Blah, blah, blah. What do you do if there's no kryptonite? Kryptonite for Superman becomes the ultimate equalizer in the DC universe. Now, whenever Batman and Superman have fought in uh, in the comics, Batman wins. But the reason Batman wins is because he cheats just a little bit and, and he has kryptonite, <laughs> whether in his gloves or fused in his armor or whatever. Uh, and of course, Batman is the one guy Superman trusts enough to give kryptonite to uh, just in case he goes crazy. And that's it's this great story stuff there, great story stuff with the characters. But really... How can Lex Luthor, even with his battle suit, how can Lex Luthor fight Superman if there's no kryptonite? How can Batman 
be a balance to Superman if there's no kryptonite? How could anybody? I mean, you can have the Justice League, but the Justice League is all useless. They're all sitting around the, the Hall of Justice and around the big table. Hey, huge catastrophe happening in uh, Australia. And all the Justice League stand up Superman's and I just wait, I'll take care of this in like five seconds. Boom, boom, done. Okay, thanks. They're all obsolete if Superman, if there's no checks and balances for Superman. Now, in, in First Man of Steel movie, that's okay because you've got General Zod, who is also a Kryptonian. Um, but, and, and if the, in the next movie, if you're just going to go with the route of a Metallo, well, I and mean, there's some villains who absolutely need Kryptonite, but maybe if you go the route of a, of a Brainiac or a, uh, I don't know, there's just several other characters you can go with. I think you have to at least introduce it. Make it rare. Don't go off on the, well, there's blue kryptonite and gold kryptonite and, and fuchsia kryptonite and rainbow color kryptonite. You don't, don't do any of that. Just kryptonite. Uh, and if you, you do that, it has to at least be introduced because Man of Steel Superman needs some form of check and balance to remain interesting. Dennis, how do you see it? I would put money on <coughs> the fact that kryptonite will be introduced mm. in the second one. I mean, we even have hints of it. But besides what uh, he mentioned, um, we had uh, Lois Lane going when when Superman was going to go uh, take down that one terraforming machine. He was, she she was like, "Oh, remember you get weak when you get near that machine." Mm. It's like, okay, they're hinting at kryptonite. I'm wondering if they're going to go the Smallville route though, where all of a sudden you get these like villains that are like born of of the, the of radioactive green stones. Yeah. I, I'm interested to see. I mean, obviously Lex Luthor won't be one of those, but maybe some of the other villains that they introduce will will, will have that effect. It's possible. All right, folks. So listen, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. But listen, while I've got you, before you do anything else, stop what you're doing. Click that subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news. And, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show and our AMC Mailbag Show over the weekends. And now we do these little editorials a couple times a week that you can see on our AMC Movie News channel. Like last night, Dennis and I did one on who should play Lex Luthor. And a uh, bunch of you guys already saw it. If you haven't seen it, just look on our AMC Movie News channel and you'll see it listed down there. Who should play Lex Luthor? A little video Dennis and I did last night. Listen, make sure you follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash AMC Theaters. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMC Theaters. Go on out and see a movie tonight. You can see World War Z or Monsters University, Man of Steel. This is the end. There's so many great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. And once again, click that subscribe button. I want to thank, as always, our very lovely host, Miss Clark Wolf. Clark, where can people find you online? They can find me on Twitter at, at Clark Wolf, and they can find me on Facebook at Official Clark Wolf. Official Clark Official Wolf. Official Clark Wolf. I also want to thank, of course, the production manager, the guy who makes everything run around here, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter uh, at Think Hero, and they can find me on Facebook, just my name. Dennis. Dennis. <laughs> Just Dennis. Just Dennis. Dennis. There's only one. Unofficially only one. Dennis. <laughs> and uh, you can find me on Twitter at John Cabio, on Facebook at John Cabio, whatever is your pleasure. So thanks a lot for joining us, guys. We'll be back again tomorrow. And until then, my name is John Cabio for AMC Movie News. Bye-bye.